Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. In 1988, I broke the math interface in all 5,000 languages, proving that language is a linear equation in algebra. This hasn't been done in 8,500 years of written language. When I did so, I was able to unlock the two-thirds of all the words missing from all languages in the world, and I can write any sentence in any language, frontwards and backwards, with the same meaning. Uh, 48 hours after I published on the internet, I had two Secret Service agents from Washington at my front door going, do you realize what you've done? You've just disqualified every treaty, trust, and contract in 8,500 years on planet Earth. Uh, he says, who did you tell? I says, everyone. I says, I sent out 100 videos, 20 hours long, including a 100-page report on the entire studies to all nations of the United Nations and over 100 TV and news agencies around the United States. By doing that, I protected myself because when you have a secret that is so profound that it would disqualify planet Earth, it would cause you to get shot. <laughs> at every seminar, at, by the end of the seminar, there's always a dozen people that walk up to you and say, why are you still walking around? Well, as Pandora, uh, uh, destroyer of worlds. Now, you might think that that's a bad thing. The word destroyer, D-E means no, and destroy is contract. Of is an adverb which connects to a pronoun in front of it. P-R-O means no, N-O means no, and U-N means no. So the word destroyer is a no, no, no word. Of is an adverb, A-D-V, it's a modifier. Modifiers connect the pronouns in front of it and modify the verb after it. Modification is change, change is motion, motion is action, and action is verb. Therefore, the word world becomes a verb. Do you live in a world of verb or do you live in a world of a fact? But because it's destroyer of verb, I destroyed the world of verb in all 5,000 languages worldwide on April 6th, 1988. And so with that said, how did this come about? Well, in 1980, I went through a divorce. And in the divorce, Judge Stanley Miller said, you cannot uh, be a father to your children. And he took away my children. I'm going, why would you do that? I've been a good father for 10 years. And he goes, because I'm a judge, he says, and I can take away people's children just because I can. I says, well, that's sex discrimination under the 1964 Civil Rights Act for Equality. Uh, I says, I'm going to prosecute you. And he says, you can't prosecute judges. I says, I beg the difference. I says, I know what the law is. You swore to support the Constitution of the United States and the laws written by the United States Congress, Senate, and Legislature. I says, that includes equality. I says, if I don't have equality, that's discrimination. Pretty simple. Uh, I got into, got into this in 1980 when my children were taken from me in a divorce. The uh, judge that took my children, I prosecuted him for, uh, under the 1964 Civil Rights Act for uh, apartheid and sex discrimination, and he was disbarred. When I lost my children in 1980, the I, of course, was upset. Taking a child away from a parent is a very hard emotional thing. In, uh, in, as, as a result of that, when the judge took away my children, that violation, that breaking of my heart, put me on a path. And that path was anger. You don't take away a, a parent's child. And the, the pain that that caused... Pain makes thought, thought makes wisdom, and wisdom grows to maturity. So as a result of that pain, I started studying. Now we go through three phases in life. You do not know what you do not know. Well, it's like putting your hand in fire. It looks pretty until you touch it and you get burnt. Well, you know what you don't know about why you got burnt. And I was aware of what I didn't know. So I had to study. 
But it wasn't about suing the man who did that. It was about suing a organization called Judges who had the power to take away children, to break people's hearts, take away foreclosed properties, destroy lives. When you're in a position of, of making judgment on another human being for profit, that's wrong, that's rape. That's rape in the first degree. Rape is using force to create a performance from another human being. Uh, I had a judge named Wazalewski, and I was in front of him 65 consecutive times suing for equal shared parenting. And every time I, he told me, every time I said yes, he would say no. So I'd go home and I would change the way I performed my lawsuit. And then uh, each time I came back and I did it the way I thought he wanted, he said no. So finally in the 65th meeting in 1985, he said, every time you say yes, I'm gonna say no. And every time you say no, I'm gonna say yes. He says, yeah, I, I will never agree with you. He says, you've been in my court 65 times. He says, you've been wrong 65 times. He says, and until you are correct, I will continue to, to uh, frustrate you by not giving you your children because you're coming to my court and you lie because you're wrong. I says, uh, so I waited about 10 seconds and I says, does three plus three equals six? He goes, yes. He says, well, you just said you would never agree with me. So then he said, no one ever went to war over a math problem in the history of mankind. And I thought for about five seconds, I said, you know, that's a true statement, Judge. So you just told me that if I find a mathematical interface on communications, that you will give me my children back. He says, yes. So I had a, had a challenge. And he walked out of the courtroom and I was putting my papers together. He came back in, he stuck his head out the door and says, you're a smart guy, you'll figure it out. It took a thousand days for me to figure it out. I did have my children on a pretty well every other weekend and, and Tuesdays and Thursdays after school. So I, I had better visitation. But it wasn't until I broke the math interface on April 6, 1988, that I was able to walk back into his courtroom and prosecute him for treason. Now this all came about um, Let's see. Well, I'll just use this. Spiral notebooks. Remember, some of you got something with the red line down the side here? Well, the way this code got broke was on April 6th in 1988. Now, for three years, I worked out math problems and nothing seemed to work. Now, one morning, I got up half asleep and I wrote one plus two equals three, three minus two equals one. On the red line, went and got my coffee, some toast, came back and I said, and I, but when I sat down, it was, it was faced this way, and I'm going, oh, that's a graft. So I grafted it. And when I grafted it, I broke the code. Next thing we're going to do here is the, uh, how this all came about. 1 plus 2 equals 3. 3 minus 2 equals 1. Okay. This is grafting. This is how the, we use the right side of the brain for this, and that's how this all came about. My cup of coffee, and I wrote this on the red line on, line on my notebook. And when I did that, the, I realized that I had a fact here, a fact here, a fact here, and a fact here, because when I do math, in order to check your math frontwards and backwards, these things have to be the same on both sides, otherwise it doesn't work. So then the equal sign is a conjunction, which is and and nor. There's only two conjunctions in the English language. And is a command, or is an option, or either. What was left was to add a plus two and a negative two, and when you do grafting, <coughs> grafting is a motion, and a motion is a verb. Or a so we gave the two the value of verb.
The reason for that is this pen is a fact. My thinking threw the pen up in the air, creating an emotion. The motion didn't change the fact. So therefore, that's how to got to be a, a verb, just basic logic. And what we had left was add, adding, subtracting. So that became the position or the preposition. But then we had the factor out, the no factor. So these became the, the positions in grammar. There's 68 positions. You have 34 positive and 34 negative. Up, down, in, out, over, under, through, around, yes, no. These all become, ad, all become your positions. Used independently, all 68 are adverbs. The articles, an article would be anything that deals with ownership. A, an, the, this, these, them. Those are all, all your articles. There's 38 articles, as a matter of fact. He, she, for your pen, for my pen, for his pen, for, for uh, this pen, for her pen, for, uh, if I want these pens, if I had two of them. And so there's, every time you, because you have 68 prepositions and 38 articles, that comes out to 1,900 divided by two is 900 definitions. So, if I, if I make a sentence here, where the bridge is over the water, and I want to write it backwards, The bridge is under for the water is under the bridge, and over and under opposite prepositions in both sentences are the same picture. Now, they can still defeat this. So what I have to do now is I have to say my position equals four. My lodial or article equals the. My verb equals is or are. I have to give closure for what my, my parts of speech are. Every lawsuit I write has closure for the parts of speech, has a styles manual built into my lawsuit, has a constitution built into my lawsuit, has a dictionary built into my lawsuit. I have two pages of complaints, but I have six pages of supporting documentation to make those two pages closure. Now, you came here, most of you, or some of you are involved with mortgages. The mortgage that you are in possession of was written entirely in adverb, verb, adverb, adjective, pronoun, and pronoun, adverb, verb. The mortgage has 6,000 mistakes on it. It is a perfect document that has absolutely zero facts on it, and it was not signed by your bank. No mortgage in the United States of 64 million mortgages was ever signed by the bank since, 18, uh, since 1934. This is a room. This room has four corners. This is a box. In this box, this is an enclosed area. Everything that happens in here has nothing to do with the rest of the world. All the information you learn here today is in a closed area for you people only. So this is a isolated scenario. So it is written, so it shall be done. Does two plus two equal four? Well, that's what I was taught. T-O plus T-O-O -O equals F-O-R, T-W-O and T-O equals F-O-R-E. Did you hear what I said when I meant what I said? What two I said plus when two I meant what I said? Four. You said two plus two equals four? Right. T-O plus T-O-O -O equals F-O-R. I can do it 120 different ways. I got it. So seven times seven is 49 times six. 300 divided by two is 150. Two plus two is equal four. Did you hear what I said, what I meant, what I said, when I said, what I meant, what I said, and only one is correct? If you don't see it written, you can't prove it. Anybody wants to, when you write a contract, you go into court, you have a syntax document. 
you are filing a lawsuit with an accuracy of 1 to 900 for every word. Your correct sentence structure communication syntax balance of the order of operations of cause and effect, a verb of thinking, a possessive of with, and an authorization of by the gives you an order of operations for every sentence that follows the rules of the operations of a court. So every single sentence is its own independent court as you make an argument. We're not dealing with 150 to 1 variables in an oral conversation. So your paperwork is going to speak for you. And mortgages. Now, your deed of trust in your mortgage, which I had showed you here before, you've got 4,700 mistakes. This is a Fannie Mae Freddie Mac. It controls 40 million mortgages in the United States. There are 38 different mortgages in the United States. The other 20 million are handled by private uh, homeowners associations, uh, credit unions write their own, private attorneys write up uh, real estate contracts for business as well as private citizens. Those are rare to come across my desk because almost all, everybody is being really aggressive with these Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. In February 2015, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae announced that we were going to file bankruptcy because of my lawsuits. And uh, they haven't filed yet, but they're getting close to it. Bank of America can no longer hire any law firm in California because all the California law firms will not do business of my names on it. Is the, and most, most attorneys, if you talk to them and you show them my business card, they'll walk away from you. They won't, even, they won't even entertain a conversation with you for fear of being taped or getting involved because they know I'm going to syntax their paperwork. They can make all the sarcastic remarks against me they want. The point is there's a thing called an international styles menu. What is an adverb? Now we're going <clears> to, <throat> while you guys are out to lunch tonight, I, I did this uh, sentence up here. Now that's an excerpt. Uh, Susan Mulloway is, a, is the chief federal judge appointed by Obama in Honolulu, Hawaii. As a result of my prosecuting judges out there successfully, continuously, she was then appointed by Obama and she issued this order against me. This is an excerpt from that in this little quote down here. And so I syntaxed it. <clears throat> it was 125% fraud and wrote a lawsuit, sent it to Obama, and said, you have a, a judge with a second grade reading level, good luck. So what I'm going to do next is show you what it actually says and how many mistakes are here. Now, it doesn't say for this court. It says this. So that becomes an adverb. Modifies the adjective court, which now issue means no contract in past time. So this becomes a for, which is a pronoun, and an 8, which represents past time with our chart over there. The word pre A is an adverb, making pre to be no filing. So that now becomes the, the, uh, the verb in this case. Now what's unique is she double spaces all of her lines. So each line has no continuance of evidence with the line after it. I'll hold that up again so you can see that. See, all of her sentences are double spaced. The courts, many years ago, after I started syntaxing the paperwork, went ahead and ordered that all the sentences be touching each other, so there was no space whatsoever. Then we came back with the, the, uh, the color codes, and they said, well, he can color code us. Now we're putting 300 words on a page for 100 bucks. This way, we only got to put 100 words on the page for 100 bucks. So they, they voted themselves a pay raise. They said, as long as he's going to syntax it and we can't stop him, we might as well go to double space. Well, double space now violates the two-space rule under styles, which breaks the continuance of evidence between each one of these sentences. So this is void continuance of evidence. The sentence is double space. Filing becomes a two. Review, re means no. Um, no contract. This becomes an adjective. Order is no. Adjective. Imposing is no which is an adjective. Restrictions is no, which becomes an adjective, making on to be a pronoun, connected to the adverb the, which now modifies the filing to be a verb because of ing, 
How is an adverb making new to be an adjective opinion of lawsuit, which now is a pronoun, connected to the, ad, to the adverb by, which now makes my name to be an adjective, adjective pronoun, because she didn't punctuate it. So then it goes on, the order, thus the adverb making no contract of order to be an adjective of the word applies, which is no contract, for, uh, three, as an adjective to the pronoun nine, for nine in future time, making all, which is also no contract, is a vowel and two consonants because she can't prove all. Nobody can prove all. Which makes action, uh, action a no contract to be an adjective of the pronoun in, which now becomes the adverb, making Miller to be a verb, and a period calls Miller a pronoun, has now is a past time adverb, which then is uh, because of the uh, wait, because the word or is here, this turns Miller into an adjective of has in past time. Or now is a conjunction which breaks the continuance, making seek to be a for, because on both sides of the or you have to have the same value, either a verb or a pronoun. Two is an adverb, making have to be a verb. Any is an adverb, making designee to be a no contract. Simulation, SI, uh, as an adjective of the pronoun name. The patterns are that she's writing, and this is the way she was taught in college, to do a one, three, four. A one, well, this should really be filing is in, uh, because of the ing, but she wrote that in a single sentence. So we're going to make that a three. So she's using a one, three, four, one, three, 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 four, one, two, one, three, three, uh, one, three, four, one, three, four, one, three, three, four, one, three, four, one, three, four, and a four, one, two, one, three, four. You see a pattern now? It's a one, three, four pattern. So she went to a specific college that taught, taught, taught her to use a one, three, four scenario. I have another federal judge, like when Wazalewski used to write his sentences, he did one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. He'd write 300 words, one, two, one, two, one, two, one. That's all he did. And he was able to perfect that technology. We have another, another law school and another judge that I work with. He does a one, three, four, one, three, four, one, three, four. So what do we got? We got music, we got a two-step, we got a quick step, we got, we got disco, one, two, one, two, one, two. <laughs> it's, it's, all, it's all dance music, folks, when you put it into rhythm. Okay, you got prosecute and defense on the what they call the common plane, and then down over here you got a bar, and this is the peanut gallery. Cross the bar. That just means you're entering into Brit foreign country, British. So this is where we sit. Now, number four is the clerk of the courts. Now, some of the clerk of the courts are on the same plane as you. But the clerk of the courts takes your money, files your papers, puts stamps on and signs them. When a clerk of the court signs a stamp, she's a post or her, he or her post, is a postmaster. When they take money for paying fines, they're bankers. You go into Black's Law Dictionary, you look up postmasters and bankers, it says, see the judge. Now when you have a, a witness, we put a witness in a witness box, which is an enclosed area and you can't be considered, so therefore you can't speak and you can't hear what's being said because he says, I swear. And when he says, I swear, we'll go over here. I swear to tell the truth, so help me God. And this is an adverb, and this is a verb. So therefore, I will do evil in future time and tell 
nothing. So help, adverb, verb, making help into an illusion of my faith as a verb. So it's, these are all fiction, and this is all modification. Therefore, you say nothing. That's why you get the first two words is you either swear or affirm. And how do you spell affirm? A-F-F, no contract. So therefore, you're talking to yourself in a box. So what do we do? We put the jury in the jury box. J-U means no law, and R-Y is contract. So no law contract is what they're hearing, an adverb verb from the witness, from the judge on a different plane than you are. There's no continuance of evidence for anybody in the courtroom. That way everyone is babbling and nobody can hear what's going on. If I do a simple thing and take this, this piece of paper and I put it on the floor here and I stand on it, you can no longer see me or hear me. I don't care what you think your illusion is, is telling you, but I'm on a different plane than you are. I don't care if it's a hundredth of an inch thick and we call it a sheet of paper. I just changed my plane, better known as a soapbox. You can no longer see or hear me, so no matter what I say, it's just your illusion. Remember the movie, The Sixth Scent, I See Dead People, with the little boy? And if you didn't watch the last minute of the movie, you didn't know that Bruce Willis was dead and he was a ghost throughout the whole movie. And that's exactly what happens here, is when you're in court, this person who's in an actor on a stage has no continuance of evidence with anything that's going on in the courtroom. So the courtroom is set up in this manner because it generates immunity. Now, if you do get into a, a, a scenario, like you want to go in and fight your, your uh, mortgage in front of a... Uh, and you get suckered into that, you're not paying attention, and you got the, the bank, bank's attorneys over there. Any evidence that you have, or if I write a lawsuit for you that you have to go into court with, and you have the forensic evidence of the mortgage syntax with that many mistakes like I showed you in color, you first have to take it up to the clerk of the court here and have it stamped and have it marked into evidence. Then you can take the witness uh, don't take the witness stand because you've left the courtroom. You're in a box now. You go back to your table and you talk about it at your table. And you tell the judge, if I go into a box, it's an enclosed area and can't be considered. And then take a $1 bill out of your pocket and say, see, these were boxes. And in 1997, the Treasury said that anything in a box is an enclosed area and can't be considered. That's why the 5s, 10s, and 20s don't have boxes on them. Or do the 50s and 100s. If you don't believe me, go back to 1961 and pull out your old money that you've got in your, that you're saving for your collection. You'll see a box around it, a little black line. And then you, you'll, win your, you'll win your argument because the post office controls the port authorities that docks the vessel of the courthouse and dry dock. Now, let's go back to that mortgage. That mortgage, which I just showed you, was fraudulent. They took that fraudulent document and they walked into the United States Treasury and they went after your social security number. Now, when you were born, we put a million dollars in your social security number. Then, with compounded interest at 6% a year, by the time you're 30 or 40 years old, I mean, we're talking 15, 20 million dollars in your social security account. So, they go ahead and they said, we got a mortgage here, this person wants to buy a house. So, the Treasury gives them cuts a check for half a million bucks. Well, that $500,000 check, though, was acquired by a fraudulent mortgage of 4,700 mistakes. So therefore, that was, a, that, was a, that was mail fraud, as well as a bank robbery. There's no statute of limitations for bank robberies, folks. I don't care if you get rob somebody's bank and you disappear and they catch you 20, 30 years later, you're gonna go to jail for 30 years for bank robbery. So now they go ahead and they take that $500,000 back to the bank and they take that money and they deposit it in their bank's name. Then they take their bank's name and they fraction it at 10 to 1 into a 10 or 20 year CD and then put the money in MasterCard or Visa at 18 to 32% uh, interest. So in nine months it's compounded and creates a half a million dollars in cash. In the meantime, the next day, they write a check, day number two, under the Title 15, Section 1635A, Rescissions Act, and they put, write a check for 500,000 bucks, and they put it back in your Social Security account, canceling your loan, saying, we're not interested in taking any money from you. So the Social Security is not looking for any missing funds. 
But the bank is sitting on $4.5 million of your money that they created out of thin air now. Then they write a thing called a note, N-O-T-E. N-O is no and T-E is contract. That's parse. They put all the numbers in boxes. They do not put a dollar sign next to any number on your note. They only write in fractured sentences of three or four or five words for each one of the lines. They're not complete sentences. They don't have a verb of thinking, a verb of performance in them. And they're all in a box. And on your contract, on your mortgage contract, they take and put brackets or parentheses or quotation marks around the number with the dollar sign on it, but that removes it from the paper. So now you don't have any value on the note, no value on the mortgage or deed of trust, and the whole thing is an illusion. But because your schools only teach you to a second grade reading level, not to insult anybody, but that's the way it is, you only have a second grade reading level and you've been brainwashed with TV, <coughs> radio, by songs and parse, and newspapers and magazines and books are all written in adverb verb. All your hymns and all your churches, your Bibles, all written in adverb verb. So you think by making an argument in the way that you communicate what they call plain English, and English is E-N-G, a vowel to consonants, which means no contract. In 1750, it was spelled end land. England changed it to English. In 1775, Benjamin Franklin changed it in the United States to, end, to English from end land. He knew what he was doing. Benjamin Franklin was the first postmaster general of the United States and Canada. July 4, 1772, appointed to the Federal Postal Court, July 4, 1775. Because he was a traitor, and he wrote it in adverb verb, the Constitution, or rather the Declaration of Independence, that was an adverb making D-E, no. Claire, speak, at, location, I-O-N, contract, declaration. Of, adverb, modifies the verb independence. In is no, D is no, pen is right, ants is contract. No, no, right contract, no, no, speak contract. So he bastardized the, the Declaration of Independence and used the first three words, which are the first three words on our passport, too, called, we the people. We is a pronoun, does an adverb, making people a verb. All feel like verbs today? Or maybe you want to be a pronoun we. Because you're a, you're a pronoun, you're a no, no, no. Well, if you're going to be a nothing, then we have to numb to Gary you because you're dead. Maritime law, Title 46, Chapter 1, Paragraph 1, Section 1. If you are dead, you cannot hold contract or own land. You cannot make contracts or hold land. And we've got to do a change here. If you, are, if you are dead, we have to nom de guerre your name. And so we give you a passport so that you can move around as a dead person. That way, if you die in a plane crash, we only call you a soul, not a person. You're just cargo. You have a bill of lading. <coughs> okay, we take a minute here. Yeah. Huh? Okay. And then... I ask people to read what it says on this thing, and they say, the United States of America. And I says, it doesn't say that. It's italicized. It's not on there. The only word on here is passport, and passport is a pronoun. It's a no, no, no. We're going to uh, go through the courtroom procedures. Now, a courtroom is divided into five different sections, and most people don't even know they're in this elaborate illusion. Some courtrooms only have two planes, but you will have a plane. And the judge, and when I get done explaining this, I'll tell you a little story. The judge sits on the top plane, so he is removed, and he's in a box. And he has his flag or his seal on his box, which means he is an independent jurisdiction. He can either see you, hear you, or have any jurisdiction. He is an actor in black robes. Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 44.1. It's the only place where it is found it says judge is an actor. So the clerk of the courts, however, sits on plane number one in most, in most courtrooms. 
Up until the time I put this presentation up here and blew the secret on clerks, they then took the clerks off of the same plane as the, as the claimant in the Vasily. A Vasily is a servant employee, servant employee of the courtroom, which is your prosecuting attorney, and you are the claimant. Don't call yourself a respondent because re means no speak. Defendant means no contract. So don't get involved with no contract language. So the clerk was then moved off of plane number one into its own separate plane. When you take the witness stand, you're going to go ahead and you're going to move yourself from the, the common and you're going to put yourself into a box. And in that box, the witness cannot hear evidence or give evidence and cannot produce any testimony. So it's mute argument. The jury box is on a different plane as well. In the jury box, when you look it up in Black Slaw Dictionary, it says this is an enclosed area that cannot witness, cannot see witnesses or hear testimony. Yep. Read it for yourself. It's all been published. They're in a box, aren't they? Which is an enclosed area. And therefore, there's no, com there's no continuance of evidence between the jury, the judge, the claimant, the vassalier, or the clerk. The whole thing is all mute. Nobody, everybody is talking to nobody. The contracts are written in adverb verb. Nothing is being contracted, nothing is being said. And what did I tell you about? What is the court? The court is the document. The Constitution are the words on the document. If the Constitution is written in adverb verb, and I swear to support the Constitution of the United States, between two people who said nothing about nothing on nothing, in a closed area of nothing without a postage stamp, and without a flag to establish jurisdiction, I've got nothing going in and nothing's coming out. <laughs> How much money you got? Well, it's $275 an hour to talk, and you have freedom of speech at 275 bucks an hour, and as soon as your money runs out, we will make a decision. We are practicing banking and commerce, and no matter what you think is happening, it never happened. <laughs> then you get to file an appeal if you don't like what nothing happened. How do you spell appeal? <laughs> APP, which means no contract. And what does the word appeal mean? It means the higher court will forgive the lower court for doing nothing about nothing with nobody <laughs> and up and agree with it. Unless it is something that will affect public opinion about how the court system operates, some genocide or apartheid case. Then they'll go ahead and they'll make a little bit of noise about it. And this is what I want you to do at home so you can practice. You take and you draw yourself a, a line in columns. You got four. Now here's another thing about what an article is. This is going to be, this is going to be your position. And this here is your, your article or your Lodial, L-O-D-I-A-L. -L. Now Lodial is location, original contract. So you got for the, of the, and then is our, which is thinking, Then you go into possession with the of. You can do, I got one sentence, it's 192 words long. <laughs> yes, you can only have one verb in a sentence. So, if you go ahead and you graph this part first, that stays the same. Now I can move my facts, which is over here, I can put it around any way I want. So this would be the claimant. Now the first thing you have to prove under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 12b1 is knowledge. It's also the last thing you gotta prove, that you have knowledge because you have the authority of knowledge. Then the second thing is the facts. Then you have a possessive of claim of the sentence structure, correct sentence structure with the contract 
which has the which becomes your vessel by the author because AU is your authority, your author, your authorization and authority always runs backwards that's why you sign at the bottom of the paper and has jurisdiction for everything in front of it now this is a mathematical procedure in every sentence in my book, my website every lawsuit I've ever written in 12,000 lawsuits is always followed on the same format because it's a mathematical certification. Now we have to take jurisdiction for what is a position using for, of, with, and by. Sometimes we use. My technology brings us to a position of accuracy that cannot be argued. And the court room is a building. That is not the document on the piece of paper. When you write a lawsuit, the paper that you have. Where's my paper? When you have when you have the lawsuit, this is the court, folks. As a judge, I swear to support the Constitution of the United States. The United States means two or more people coming together in a closed area. Doesn't this have thing four corners? For, this is a closed area. It's called paper. It carries the cargo words. The words have terms and definitions. This book not only has a sentence, but every word in this book is defined and has a syntax quantumized definition. Every word is accounted for in this book, including a lot more words. And of all the two million words in the English language, we've got 720 words that are syntax. That's it. Pretty simple. Average person has a 12,000 word vocabulary, you only need 720 to learn syntax. And in 99% of the cases, you use less than 50 different words in an entire lawsuit to win your case. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. It's, it's so simple. Once you get it, it's, it's mathematical. But this is the court. This is the contract between you and the judge. The courtroom is irrelevant. The seals that are hanging on the walls are irrelevant. This flag is the correct sentence structure communication syntax flag, which advertises that this is correct. You place a postage stamp up on your corner. You sign across it. That makes you the postmaster transporting the vessel of the document to the clerk of the court, which is the port of the court. She puts her stamp on it. When she puts her stamp on it, you sign your name across her stamp, making you a postmaster of not only your paperwork and your vessel, but now you're in contract with the port, port authorities of the court, because this is a courthouse, which is a foreign vessel in dry dock, so you've entered a foreign vessel. Now you're the postmaster and clerk of a foreign vessel in dry dock. Now you've got a 24 karat gold bonded, document that has to go in the court. But if you're, going to, if you're going to sign the stamp on the front, you have to also endorse the back of the top of the cover page because that's called an endorsement. How many of you can cash a check at the bank without endorsing your check? Nobody. Because if you take the document and you roll it up, when you unroll it, the top of the back, when they seal those scrolls, they would put a seal on it. That was the endorsement. And that, that gave the document its value. And not only that, this book is bonded together. When I went to court in 1997, I used to have three ring notebooks with my paperwork in it. I went to testify. The judge says, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm testifying to my book. He says, that's all loose paper. He says, you got to have a bonded book in order to be an author with the authorization to talk about the authority of your authentic document. And it's a document, that's why you get a docket number when it, the vessel comes to the court and it gets docketed. Uh, you can have three forms of bonding. You can glue it, you can stitch it, and you can rivet it. Thank you for watching. My name is Paul Colin Derrick. Hyphen Thomas. If you would like to ask any questions or would like to receive some coaching with the correct sentence structure, parse syntax construct, 
please don't hesitate to contact me in the private and confidential. Derek Thomas Coach at gmail.com. Again, thank you for watching.